Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the second time I've been here in the Mars District, and uh, it's always a pleasure. Toronto and Canada in general is a hot spot of activity in this space. And looking around this room, one thing that really strikes me is how diverse this audience is, in every sense of the word. Uh, so many people from so many different backgrounds uh, gathered here to talk about this incredible technology. And I do want to talk about technology. When I first got into this space and I started talking about Bitcoin, one of the common misconceptions when I spoke to a room full of people was that they expected some kind of sales pitch. They expected that, like selling a timeshare for a holiday resort or a get-rich-quick scheme, I was there to recommend investment in this newfangled currency, in this stock, this Bitcoin thing, a get-rich-quick scheme. And Bitcoin isn't a get-rich-quick scheme, but some could argue that it certainly can be a get-poor-quick scheme if you don't manage it quickly. You know, the joke goes, how do you make a million dollars in trading Bitcoin? You start with two, and then you day trade. <laughs> and very quickly, you will lose your shirt. How many in this room, without looking at their portable devices, can tell me uh, what the price of Bitcoin is today? How many of you know what the price of Ether is today? How about the Dow? <laughs> It is a big mistake to treat these technologies as stocks, yet it is a, is a common misunderstanding. because They look like stocks. Right? They have got a price, they trade, they have volatility. We can look at volume and graphs and things like that. But of course, these are not equities. They're, Bitcoin isn't a company. Bitcoin is an industry, and it is a currency, and it is a technology platform. And this very strange thing has happened in this space, where it has a tradable instrument, and we haven't seen that before. You know, when the internet started, you couldn't buy internet and trade it. Oh, look, Yahoo launched something. I bet my internet stock is going to go up. You couldn't do that, right? It's probably a good thing you couldn't, because <laughs> boy, that would have been volatile. Now, Bitcoin isn't a stock, and it's not an index stock for the industry, even though it sometimes behaves like that. And none of the cryptocurrencies are that. At a very fundamental level, these are technology platforms. But the instrument that's traded behaves a bit like an equity, a bit like a bond, a bit like an index stock, and very much so as a currency. But not the traditional type of currency that we know, not a currency with a very large economy behind it, but a currency with a very small, very dis distributed economy behind it, one that is buffeted by daily events, media announcements, for example, the announcement that Bitcoin died again. Someone's writing that article already. And all of these things make the price move a lot. So when you get involved in this space, a lot of people think, okay, maybe I should invest in Bitcoin. Maybe I should invest in Ether. Maybe I should create a portfolio. And I've spent the last four years dissuading people from that mentality. Do not treat this as an investment. And the primary reason you should not treat this as an investment, unless you happen to be an investment professional, is that these things are extremely volatile. So you have to be very careful. You have to pick your timing right. Buy low, sell high, which is of course the exact opposite of what naive people like me do. Right? It's going up, time to buy. <laughs> it's crashing, time to sell. <laughs> you get the timing wrong, you lose a lot of money. What about picking which thing you would invest in? Would you invest in the Dow? Would you invest in Ether? Should you really be investing in Bitcoin? What about these new things that are popping up every now and then with the initial coin offering? Should you be investing in those? So picking the right time and picking the right location for your investment, the right thing to invest in, will determine whether you have success or not. So I say don't do that because I have a much better recipe for success. 
and that is to invest in something that does not require timing, to invest in something that does not require choosing, to invest in something that cannot be lost, cannot be seized, cannot be forfeited, and that is skills and knowledge. You don't need timing to invest in learning about this technology. Learn now, and that skill will pay, possibly for years to come. If you learned how to do web development in 1997, you had a 15-year career ahead of you for a highly sought-after skill. If you learned how to do iPhone apps in 2003, you had again, uh, sorry, in 2008, you had again a massive career ahead of you. Uh, for a highly sought-after skill. With learning in these, these skills, you don't need to choose. Do I learn about Ethereum? Do I learn about Bitcoin? Do I learn about the DAO? You can learn about all of these things, because these skills are highly transferable. The things that you learn about Bitcoin will teach you about blockchains in general. You will learn about consensus algorithms. You will learn cryptography. You will learn the basics of economics and game theory, distributed systems, concurrent systems, security. All of these skills apply to all of the investments in this space. This is a skill that cannot be taken from you, that you can't lose in an afternoon because of volatility. That will continue to apply, at least for a decade, probably more, no matter which direction Bitcoin goes, no matter which direction Ethereum goes, or any of the other currencies. So, after all, I am here to pitch you an investment. I am here to tell you to invest in skills. And this, my friends, is a get-rich-slow scheme. <laughs> it takes work, and if you work hard in this space, you will gain a lot. One thing I have found is that this is a space that moves so fast, the learning is a continuous effort. Every single day I learn something new, and I've been at it full time for more than four years in this space. And every day I learn something new. Every day I learn something that redefines my understanding of this technology, that makes me think about it in a slightly different way, that unveils a new level of insight and depth that I hadn't anticipated. On the surface, it's a currency. It's a payment system. And if you just see the surface, you're missing everything. Because underneath there is this enormous, rich depth of complexity. If you see my book, you'll notice on the cover there is a woodcut of ants, leafcutter ants. O'Reilly uses an animal on the cover of every one of their books, but I chose that one very carefully. Ant colonies are remarkable systems in which the individual is irrelevant, in which this very simplistic organism, with just a few tens of thousands of neurons, that can be simulated on a computer quite easily. These individuals follow some very specific, very simple rules, triggered by an environment of chemical sense. Within the individual, there is no complexity. But you put a million of them together, and what they build is this superorganism, this emergent complexity that is the only species on the planet that rivals the social complexity and construction of human society. Leafcutter ants don't eat leaves. They use an enzyme to break them down and brew them in giant breweries. They use the pulp that is produced to feed aphids that they farm like cattle. They milk the aphids to get nectar that they feed to their larvae. They are an agricultural society with enormous complexity. and None of that exists in the brain of a single ant. Distributed systems like Bitcoin are systems where tens of thousands of nodes, each following a very well-defined simple set, of consensus rules, come together, interacting with a vast, complex society of human incentives and actions, to produce this enormously complex, secure trust platform, which exhibits all of these characteristics of real applied game theory on a massive scale never seen before. The emergence of robust trust 
backed by thermodynamic guarantees in the case of proof of work, to create the most secure system we have ever built on this planet. We take the concept of proof of work that has existed for millennia. Proof of work is evident when you look at our societies. The pyramids of Giza are proof of work. What they say is, behold a civilization that can marshal tens of billions of dollars worth of value, hundreds of thousands of slaves over tens of years to produce a monument that cannot be replicated unless you put an equal amount of work. The great cathedral of Notre Dame, the great castles of medieval Europe, all of these things, the Great Wall of China, are proof-of-work artifacts. They are monuments of civilizations that say, here is something that you can only build through the massive expenditure of resource, and that stands as evidence of our might. Bitcoin is the first planetary-scale monument of proof-of-work. and In its footsteps, others will follow. It creates this edifice, this monument, and it's a monument to security. It's a monument to trust on a network scale. Once you start understanding the complexities of the interaction of game theory, human motivation, incentives, and markets, you realize how deep this system is. We've never seen free markets operate in the way they do in things like Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrencies. Truly unfettered free markets that provide complete liquidity and flexibility on a global scale have never happened before. Payment systems that span the globe without borders or intermediaries have never happened before. We are standing on the front row of history while creating something that will change human society. And if you learn the skills that allow you to understand these simple systems that produce this enormous complexity, these skills will serve you well. Now, you may be thinking, but I need to be a developer to learn these things. And that's not true. Sure, if you're a computer scientist, this is probably one of the most amazing things that's happened in computer science since HTTP. If you're a developer, you can learn a lot about this space. If you're interested in distributed systems, this is a revolutionary implementation of distributed systems. But what if you're an accountant, a lawyer, an economist? When you first look at Bitcoin, the initial inclination, the initial feeling is, let me take the tradition I have in my profession and see how that will affect Bitcoin. What will be the impact of traditional economics on Bitcoin? What will be the impact of central banks creating their own currency, or of banks regulating Bitcoin? What will be the impact of law on Bitcoin? What will be the impact of the accounting rules on Bitcoin? And if that's what you see, you're missing the much more important bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that Bitcoin will introduce a seed of disruptive innovation in every single one of these industries. The question is not what will the law do to Bitcoin, but what will Bitcoin do to the law? What will Bitcoin do to banking? What will blockchain technology do to economics and central banking? What will Ether do to contracts? What will these new technologies do in a field that has certain methods, processes, and traditions that go back hundreds of years? <coughs> because disrupting computer science is not a big deal. I mean, we barely have any tradition, right? This is a space that only has 60 years of history. What happens when you disrupt law that has 4,000 years of history? And we are disrupting those spaces. Let me give you just one example. Or actually, I'll give you several. Blockchains create new economic tools that we've never seen before. I've coined the terms computational microeconomics and computational macroeconomics to describe just two of these new fields. The study of macroeconomics involves today the ex post facto analysis, six months after the fact, by statistical approximation 
of the velocity and activities of an economy, an entire economy. With blockchains, we can do real-time, data-based macroeconomics, and this has never happened before. We have never had the opportunity to look at an economy and study the velocity and inflation rates in real time. And we could do that with blockchains. In the study of microeconomics, studying the activities of a company or an industry or market, the best we can do again is ex post facto analysis six months after the fact to a statistical approximation, but no more with blockchains. We can look at the impact on specific markets and companies in real time. We are going to have to start thinking about real-time accounting and providing information to consumers of this data who can look at companies and industries in real time and evaluate their activity. We are reinventing accountability and transparency, turning it on its head, providing simultaneously very strong privacy to individuals, and a very strong impetus towards transparency and accountability for social organizations and governments. The opposite of what we have sometimes today, which is how it should be. If you look at all of the things that exist in all of these industries that have hundreds of years of tradition, it is important to realize that the traditions, the methods, the tools that we use in law, in economics, even in computer science, in accounting. It is not about the tools. And this is a point we often miss. One of the characteristics of any profession is to establish traditions that propagate the tools and the means, and create out of those structures of permanence through academia, through professional certification, through regulation. And sometimes, the more enmeshed you are in that profession, the easier it is to forget why. Why do we have these processes? Why do we have the tools? What were the goals? Because we have become so attached to the means that we forgot what we are doing them from. I can't tell you how many times people tell me, that in blockchains we need identity, as if identity was the goal. Identity is a means to an end. Identity is the means of establishing, as a second order effect, the reputation. And reputation is a means to establishing, as a third order effect, the risk of default. You don't care who someone is. You care whether they will pay you next month. And yet we have become so attached to the means, we forgot about the goal. The goal is default risk. But we have associated that so completely with identity that we can't even imagine a way of protecting against default risk in any other way than full identity, with all of the problems that comes with. And yet, with a multi-sig contract, I can protect against default risk with a party that is completely anonymous. I don't need identity to achieve my goal. In looking at these technologies, we have to identify, really, what are the goals we are trying to achieve? And do these technologies give us a way of achieving those goals with fewer side effects, with greater efficiency, and with lower costs? And if the answer is yes, feel free to drop the 500-year-old tradition if it doesn't serve you. Feel free to sacrifice the sacred cows of accounting, law, justice, law enforcement, economics, and computer science, if they do not serve you. Because now we have a new tool, a new set of tools. And if we carefully study these tools, we can learn how to apply them in ways that completely change the way we structure society and allow us to more directly achieve the real goals that we have in all of these other fields. It is very difficult to step outside of tradition, 
and training and professional development and a sense of camaraderie. And when you do step outside of those things in your profession, you will be ridiculed. You will be ostracized. You will be called a fool. Have faith. Most of the really great people in this world who did great things and changed the world were called fools by all of their peers. Fools like Edison and Ford and Tesla, Marconi, Maxwell, Einstein. None of them were greeted with open arms and accolades by their professional peers. They were ostracized, ridiculed, and called fools because their very ideas offended hundred-year-old traditions, sometimes thousand-year-old traditions. Be the fool that's right. And the best way to do that is to invest in learning the really, really subtle nuances, the really deep knowledge and insights of this amazing set of technologies that is absolutely going to change our world. Thank you. So um, I think we do have a bit of time for questions. Uh, if I can get a time check. Okay, we have ten minutes, so we can uh, take a few questions from the audience. Anybody have a question for me? Yes. Uh, microphone coming to you. Just one second. Microphones behind me. Did someone grab? Thank you. Thank you so much. That's number eight for the audio deck. Thank you. And number seven. There you go. This is our first Q&A session of the day, so we're just going to iron out some wrinkles there. Go ahead, sir. Okay, great. Thanks for the uh, great talk. Um, I'm just curious if you could comment on the DAO. Um, <laughs> awesome. The I am shocked and surprised that that would be the first question you would bring up. <laughs> um, I'm conflicted on the DAO. I've been watching this uh, with great fascination. Um, mandatory disclosure: I am a DAO token holder. I, I bought, um, you know, I'm, I'm a whale in DAO spaces. Um, I own forty dollars worth of DAO token. <laughs> I know it's your law, aren't you? Um, so I bought that because uh, as I, I invest in a number of different cryptocurrencies, because. Um, in all of these systems, the best way to learn is to do. Right? And in order to do, you have to hold a token. If you want to write an Ethereum contract, you have to have Ether. If you want to use Dash or Monero or uh, Bitcoin or Storage Coin or whatever, you have to own the token. So I did buy uh, DAO tokens. I also warn people um, on social media that um, this is the first one. It's completely untested. And um, it will probably be extremely risky. I did not expect it to blow up within just four weeks of launch. That was quite fast. Um, but you know, one of the things I've said is that the most interesting lessons come not from success but from failure. If you think of this as a particle physics um, experiment, the really interesting science happens when you analyze the debris of a fire, fiery explosion. Right? You smash two particles together, create a very big bang, and then you look at what comes shooting out of that um, collision. Uh, well, we're going to be studying the debris of the fiery collapse of uh, the Dow for years, and it's going to teach us a lot about governance. I think it's important to realize that if you look at this from the perspective of capitalism, you need destruction in order to learn. And one of the things that is unique about all of these systems is we're not talking about them, we're not theoretically analyzing them, we're doing them. And that's the only way to learn, and sometimes that means spectacular problems like this. Um, and I, I think that's okay, as long as you go into it knowing the risks. And, and really, people should understand the risks before they get involved. Now, how is this going to be resolved? Uh, there are no good options at this point. 
Um, there's a lot of people who suggest that perhaps it should be allowed to fail, um, that it's a great security bounty for the person who discovered the flaws, and that the investors caveat emptor knew what they were getting into. Um, others say that this should precipitate a, a soft fork followed by a hard fork and other interventions in the Ethereum chain. Um, the idea is appealing. It sets up a terrible precedent um, that may cause more problems than it solves. And I'm not going to take either position because I have the luxury of not being uh, either a miner or one of the Ethereum core developers who has to make this very difficult decision. Um, I'm going to watch with interest, but there are no good options. In the end, though, um, I don't think this changes the, the fundamental nature of these things. Smart contracts are fascinating. They will have an enormous impact on law, on commerce, on the Internet of Things, uh, on many other technology fields. Uh, the implementation of distributed autonomous organizations, either as investment vehicles or as um, new forms of social organization for entrepreneurs, uh, for cooperatives, for uh, any form of governance-based uh, social entity. Um, all of these things are amazing, and they will happen again and again and again, and more of them will blow up spectacularly, and we will learn. Um, you know, even, even Enron taught us something, if, if not at least to improve our accounting standards and practices. Right? And, um, you know, we have uh, four of the uh, great accounting and management consulting firms here today. Um, ten years ago, there were five. Oops. So you know, sometimes that's the price you pay for innovation. All right, uh, let's see if we have one more question in the back there. So I'm speaking from one of the accounting and consulting firms. I'm enough. So there's so much of hype now. Like a year ago, our clients, our folks, who don't know about blockchain, and now I get into a meeting and everybody's like, "This is it." I've read so much about it, but then I'm wondering: is this the hype? That's kind of building into it, and I see proof of concepts being done. But if they are, if they are to be scared that it's at least five years away, that's what I kind of see. It's like, would blockchain survive that long? And uh, what would it take? Fundamentally, one or two examples or events that will actually make it mainstream, and people would start talking real things rather than just building hype about it. Um, I think you're absolutely right. The hype around blockchain is entirely out of sync with um, the actual implementations, um, with one exception, and that exception is the Bitcoin blockchain. And you could also say, perhaps, with two exceptions, because Ethereum is also a now have, has become a, a large-scale uh, viable production system with with still some growing pains, but definitely something to watch carefully. So there are a couple of really important blockchains in the world today, and uh, other than that, we're seeing an enormous amount of hype. I think part of that represents just kind of the general economic uh, conditions. Um, if you have a lot of money, and in many uh, corporations today, a lot of money is the is the situation because of uh, free money and stimulus and low interest rates that we've been in now for. Uh, six or seven years, what are you going to invest it in? Equities, that's a bubble. Real estate, that's a bubble. Student loans, that's a bubble. Auto loans, that's a bubble. Bonds, that's a bubble. Corporate bonds, that's a bubble. And so, one of the problems we have in all of the Western developed economies is that we have a lot of money chasing very little yield, and that tends to create these um, exuberances. And so people are looking at blockchain and say, okay, maybe fintech is the place where we might get some yield. Um, and I think the investment has far outpaced the reality on the ground, which will eventually correct. But in, if you look at the broader space, you have to realize there are some real blockchains changing things in a very real way. And uh, those blockchains are the open transnational, borderless, open access, open innovation, permissionless blockchains uh, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum and others 
that are setting the stage for real change with real applications today. A lot of hype, but also a seven-year experiment that refuses to die, continues to deliver more and more innovation every year, and will continue to surprise people. Five minutes, let's take one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Maybe two questions if we have a quick one. Hey Andres, thanks for the talk. Um, do you mind commenting quickly on um, alternative consensus mechanisms that are being proposed in different blockchain environments, um, and maybe how that impacts you know what your view is on the private versus public blockchain space as well? Thanks. I, I think consensus algorithms are really a very interesting area. Um, it's basically a new science. Uh, started in January third, two thousand nine, with one. And if you look at the, the number of academic, pa academic papers published in this space, they're growing at a hyperbolic rate at the moment. So hundreds and hundreds of PhD dissertations and papers on consensus algorithms in the last year. And I only expect that pace to increase. I expect we're going to see entire degrees, um, master's degrees perhaps, or postgraduate MPhils or PhDs focused on consensus algorithms. Um, there are many interesting experiments in that space, but to me, the really important thing is running your experiment in the wild, at scale, with real actors, real money at stake, uh, and seeing how it survives in those conditions. Uh, this is not a theoretical science. This is an experimental science, where we can run global-scale experiments uh, and prove these systems in real terms. And I think that that's really, to use the trite expression, where the rubber meets the road. So until we see large-scale deployments of practical use of novel consensus algorithms, I know one that works today, and that's proof of work. We'll see what comes next. That doesn't mean you can't do it another way, uh, but I think it's also important to recognize that different consensus algorithms produce different characteristics and features. Proof of work produces thermodynamically guaranteed immutability, which is something you can't do any other way. Um, and maybe with proof of stake, we're going to see different results, different features, different characteristics. This is a broad ecosystem in which uh, different systems will specialize for fitness to a particular niche, uh, application, use case, and there's plenty of room for a lot of competition. This is not the old zero-sum national currency game where in any particular domain there can be only one and it's a winner takes all. That's not what we're doing here. It's completely different. Let's take one more question and then we'll wrap it. Hi. So I know that uh, decentralization is the ultimate and final goal. Uh, I know you made mention of uh, breaking and challenging traditions. Uh, do you feel that a radical change and transformation to this can be accepted and adopted with ease? <clears throat> or do you feel that a more gradual transition is the more logical route with uh, more honest and transparent centralization methods of uh, methods and practices for uh, mainstream public adoption? Um, I think uh, neither is really the correct answer. Um, first of all, I don't think you can have gradual transformation. Uh, history shows us that um, disruptive innovation never works in a gradual fashion. Um, revolutionary change, if you read about uh, you know, the, the philosophy of science, if you read Knuth, if you read uh, the history of science, what you will see is uh, this form of punctuated equilibrium, where you have the status quo and tradition establish um, kind of a plateau where ideas are relatively stale for very long periods of time, and then a little spark knocks everything out of equilibrium. Uh, it gets very chaotic for a short period, and then it resettles into a new norm. Uh, and we see that again and again in science. We also see it in technology. We also see it in politics. We see it in society. Gradual is not the way of this world. Uh, what you have is systems that build up uh, energy within them until they reach a tipping point, 
and then uh, some event, uh, you never know what kind of event it will be, triggers that tipping point, and you have a sudden cascade into a new reality. We will not see a gradual transition into a new world um, through these technologies. And part of the reason is that there are many places in the world where people will not wait. Um, where mainstream adoption is not going to be done because of a whim, it is going to be done because of a desperate need. Talk to a Venezuelan, an Argentinian, a Brazilian, a Kazakh, a Ukrainian, um, perhaps even a Greek or a Cypriot, and they will tell you that um, looking at these types of technologies as a safe haven, as an exit, as a safety valve from failing uh, monetary systems is a very real possibility. Uh, and when you have that level of desperation, there is nothing to stop people from adopting them. Now, um, I can guarantee you that we do not need acceptance. We do not need uh, the participation of the old system. We do not need the permission of the traditional systems in order to succeed. Uh, people will use these things because they are useful, and they will use them because they can opt in and choose to use them when they feel they are ready. When we give them a use case, when we give them an application that is sufficiently compelling to overcome their comfort zone. And then they will find a way to use these technologies. Uh, but I certainly don't uh, expect that we will see this primarily driven by traditional institutions gracing us with permission and acceptance, uh, so that we can innovate from within, disrupt the disruptors, create change from within the organizations. That stuff doesn't happen. In reality, large organizations can't do that. And they get disrupted from the outside, most of the time very painfully, and few of them survive in their original form. So, start learning the skills, polish up your resume, and get ready for a roller coaster. This is going to be fun. All right. Thank you very much. We'll close the questions there.